I'm Claire Evelyn, design enthusiast and space curator. I've been designing and coaching clients for seven years, helping you create beautiful and functional spaces by learning new techniques, understanding research, and making mindset changes is my area of expertise. I want you to live in a space that compels and inspires you. I created the Spaces Speak podcast to facilitate discussions about higher purposes in design and how anyone can integrate intentional design into their daily lives to improve their habits, routines, and reach their goals. I interview intriguing guests from a variety of disciplines, artists, psychologists, entrepreneurs, authors, and more. Anyone who has knowledge to share to help people redesign their space and transform their life. Before we dive in, I want to tell you about my free design quiz. The quiz will help you figure out not only what interior design style suits you, but also how to get started executing that style in your home. Just head over to trimspaces.com and the button to take the quiz is right there on the home page. Welcome to the very first episode of Spaces Speak. Today, I'm really excited to interview and introduce my friend, Daniel Reynolds. Dan has studied drawing, painting, and foundational design. He earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Architecture and a Professional Master of Architecture from the Savannah College of Art and Design. He completed his thesis on strengthening democracy through transparency, connecting the public and state at the NSA, and has collected seven design awards from the American Institute of Architects. Dan joined the Savannah architecture firm of Felder and Associates, where he contributed to the design and construction of several buildings and historic preservation efforts in the Savannah Historic District. In 2020, Dan joined the Maryland-based architecture firm of the Drawing Board, developing architectural works in the historically and environmentally sensitive areas of Annapolis. Hey, Dan! Good morning, Claire. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing well, thank you. I want to jump right in and ask you the signature question. What's your most interesting piece of furniture or like a piece of decor that's in your house so so actually my my favorite piece of furniture um is my so I'm I'm calling you from my parents house because my parents are (laughs) holding on to my favorite piece of furniture oh Um, my gosh yes yes, and and uh honestly it looks very nice in your home so I'll let them hold on to it for now but it's actually (laughs) the desk that I'm speaking from you to you from oh. right now. And um I could I could show it to you. It's a it's a shaker sure. desk. Um I believe it's cherry. Um and it's it's a uh, I inherited it from my grandparents, my father's parents. And it's it's very traditional in in its uh styling, um, but it's minimalist. So it's kind of an interesting like it's modern but not modern. It's minimalist, but not modern. So it's, gotcha. it's a lovely. It's a lovely piece, and and one day it'll be in my house, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll telework from it. Um, but I can, um, if you bear with me, really. Quickly, yeah, I yeah, can. that is interesting because most things that are not modern are not really minimal. <laughs> you'll you'll see, you'll see. So it's okay. it's actually. It's a, oh wow! Oh, it's that a, is really pretty. So it's it's shaker, and it's you know very traditional. I wouldn't say classic, but traditional. But it's very, mm-hmm. um, uh, very very minimal. I love these skinny legs that look yeah. like they could break. Like they're so delicate. <laughs> um, the proportions are lovely, and I just I just love this piece. Um, the little drawer with the two with the two poles of the same wood. I'm I just love I just love this. Um, and how the they chamfer the the detail at the end. It's not just a plinth of wood. They mm-hmm. they uh, whoever produced it chamfered this, so it's just delicate all the way around. Yeah. I would almost I would almost characterize this as a feminine uh, stylization. This is not a masculine heavy like jacket no. piece, but I just love the airiness of it. In fact, it works it works well in front of a window because it hardly blocks the window. So yeah, it um, does. <laughs> they picked so a good spot. Is, <laughs> this is my this is probably my favorite piece though I would characterize my, myself design wise as a um 
as a modernist. So, mm. uh, so this is, I'll find a way to fit this in, in my, in my decor otherwise. So, um, so if that answers your question. <laughs> no, it does. Yeah. And then I can, so. you know, with, I'm sure there's the meaning behind it too, of yes. having inherited from your grandpa. So that makes right. it even more special. Right. Yes, it is. So, yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So I was reading your bio and I didn't know that you uh first started off drawing and painting. So what what is that something that was always a part of your childhood? It it, it was. Um I always my earliest memory actually was in preschool and I was drawing. I like to draw. Everybody else was on the playground getting messy with runny noses and like <laughs> playing the mud and I liked I liked drawing and I liked drawing houses I liked oh, funny. I, I was okay. interested in porches and shutters and my earliest memory was drawing like what would be a we would characterize as like a farmhouse today um and I just it, I, I was such a nerd I liked oh I don't know I like I like the gable and I like little shutters and and like four or five years old that was kind of odd but I, I, yeah. it fits with me now it fits with me now so um I uh that was um I, I've always liked drawing but in high school I got a little bit more serious about it there's a um I, I grew up in the Annapolis region um and they have here um a um <clears throat> a arts academy for the public so you could take drawing and painting and ceramic courses here so I was able to supplement my public school art education um, or what little art education there was in the public schools with outside uh, uh, courses like figure drawing and painting and mm. ceramics. I really got into to wheel pottery, um, though I haven't done it in years. Um, and uh, so that was that was my later teens that I, I got into that before I got really official with it by going to art school. So Okay. Um, yeah, so it's always been, I've always enjoyed drawing and, um, and, uh, and putting things together. So it's kind of <laughs> just in my DNA, I guess. Did I you find a, uh, a community <laughs> of friends that were also in, interested in art when you were that young? Yes, yes. Okay. So in, in high school, I founded the art club. <laughs> uh, yeah. I know, I know. That's right? cute. <laughs> um, for people who liked uh, who liked drawing and uh, painting, and um, looking back, we didn't have very much talent at that point in our lives. But it was fun to like after school, like um, compare and and give each other kind of rudimentary critiques on each other's like self portraits or whatever we were working on. Um, and uh, so that was that was really that was fun. So there was a little a little community. Uh, of us there um, before I went to again art school where everybody was the art kid back in their previous high school so yeah uh, right you know so um so initially that was that was my first uh art our artist community I guess I would say yeah uh, that were that you started mine, yeah right? that's so neat exactly. it's kind of fun so, so you said it was in your DNA or your parents um artists yeah yeah, my mother, my mo so my parents are both scientists, but my mother, my mother is a watercolor artist on the side, oh. and so she she really likes to do watercolors of um, outdoor scenes and um, and uh, kind of waterscapes because she's a hydrologist, so she likes marshes. Oh, so, so it's kind of it's kind of clever. And for her work, she would travel around the state and go to these different uh, wetlands, and she would paint them which was kind of interesting just just for fun right um, and then her mother my grandmother was a very serious um she, uh, she got into oil painting and recreating oh. like, like dutch master paintings and um we don't have any uh, in possession here my my aunt has them but um they look like they look they could be really good forgeries like wow. uh, it's incredible yeah um so so now i have to go to Europe and see the originals because I've grown up with these these great copies. Um, so there there was a little bit of uh, artistry in the family and my and my father's younger sister is a art professor or was an art professor I believe at the University of Vermont. Um, so she so there's there's artists around um, yeah, yeah. artists and, and scientists but I I definitely was the design 
uh, <laughs> the hardest person. I, I, I'm not uh, as a like hard sciences person. So right, um, right, yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember um, like color playing a big role in your life as a kid, or were you more just focused on sketches? I so actually, it's funny you mentioned that because I was very drawn towards kind of as far as environments go, like like interior design, I was very drawn towards always a, a muted color palette. I really yeah. love, I love tone on tone and, and minimal, like like serene um, shades of, of neutrals. I've always been drawn to that. And the paintings that I did when I was younger were always very subtle in their colors. I'm not a loud pop of color kind of person I love that but that's not my I'm I'm it's not you so, it's not me so I, I I love these tones on tones um kind of kind of uh things but color as far as color goes my favorite color is blue and I really like soft shades of blue um and which which is a serene um calming color um I would say orange and yellow and the warm colors I'm not drawn towards colors of anxiety <laughs> and passion. So I, um, I'm, uh, I'm a cool, cool tones kind of guy. Um, and, uh, I've always, always been drawn towards, towards that, uh, that color palette. So, yeah. Do you, do you, so you see <laughs> that as a trend kind of through your, um, yes. art career? Yeah. Oh, yes, okay. yes, it is. And for, <laughs> in fact, for, for many, many, many years, I would only wear black. No. And only only wear black and um uh in homage to that I'm wearing a black shirt right now um but um I would only wear black as kind of like an artistic statement the very mute you know right. very muted it's like it's just it's almost a frame for for my skin you know I have dark features and that would just it would just be there would be no pops of color to to draw any more attention to myself I just wanted serene quiet even in the way I carried myself so Wow. Um, um, but I've I've let loose with that and let people know that I I'm not sad, <laughs> which I, I never was. I would never was yeah. misinterpreted for that. So right, right. Um, That's very self aware uh, of you, though, to you know carry know that that that's how you want to portray yourself, especially in high yeah. school. If you were doing in high then. school, yeah, it was yeah. way even back in high school I was doing that. So that's that's true. That was definitely. True. <laughs> Yep. Do you know, do you know why I was just um, talking to somebody about this? Do you know why blue is your favorite color? Blue, I, I, I blue is my favorite color because um, it's, it's cliche to say, but water and, and the sky is blue. Yes. Um, but it's a serene color of low energy. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not an energetic color, like red or orange, or yellow, which are lovely colors. All right. colors are wonderful. We love we love the spectrum of colors and of the world, um, but but blue is the color of, for me, has always been the color of, of tranquility and and quiet and silence, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that is that just very much fits with my kind of worldview of tranquility and peace or wanting that at least. I don't know if I, I don't know if I've achieved that in my life, but it's, <laughs> I, I aim for that and I'm, I'm uh, drawn to it. So I, I always loved blue. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of a, um, in blue, in blue environments, I'm maybe happiest shades of blue. So right, uh, right. not, not very chromatic blues, but uh, uh, definitely that's, I, Again, cliche to say, but but it's the color of nature. So yeah, um, well, often kind of nature, but yeah. Do you think it has to do with growing up in Annapolis and your mom being in hydrology too? Yes. It could very it could very well be subconsciously that as well. And and um, I, uh, I I think I think that could could very much be the case. I, with that said, I don't know if I could ever live in a landlocked state, um, <laughs> not not on some coast or near a river. Um, mm -hmm. I've always always ever had. Uh, access to water in some way, even though I'm not a boater myself, I just I, I appreciate that. So, um, so yeah, so uh, for sure, I that that very well could be um, um, the case. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm interested. So, um, I've been doing research lately on colors and how they are affecting you in an environment, um, and I have two blog posts that now that you say this about blue makes me realize they're somewhat contradictory but the 
having blue in your environment has like actually been shown to make people feel more peaceful like having blue walls being near right. nature that's blue however on the other side blue light is completely different <clears throat> This is true. And actually alerts you and yes. keeps your brain active. Do you know, do you know a lot about that? Um, well, I know personally that if I'm on my phone a lot before bed in yeah. a dark room, like with, you know, if I can't sleep and I'm reading, reading the news with the blue light, I know that that I, I, it has to be more than a correlation that it, it energizes me. And I feel, mm -hmm. I feel stimulated by it and awake. Um, and, um, I'm not, I don't know the science behind the, the wavelengths of light and how that actually the science behind it, but I know viscerally from my own experience that blue light does, uh, I would say it's, it's, it's psychologically stimulating. I feel more right. awake. Um, and so it's something to avoid before bed, which is hard yes. to do because the phone is so easy. You know, you could just read the news, which is not also a thing to help with sleep but um right before bed but, um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah no it's, it's an interesting contradiction that blue light does in fact uh has been shown or is now being understood to um be something that is that is energizing and not peaceful and not uh a tranquil um effect on us yeah right right which yeah <laughs> it's yeah it's so interesting that just having um like paint that's blue is completely yeah. different than having um like a blue you know yeah blue light or a blue light bulb or, right. or whatever right. so it makes you really think about conscious color choices you know you're not just yeah. randomly choosing blue you got to think about okay what are the effects behind actually having this color present in this specific room Certainly. you know how is that going to affect somebody at at different times Certainly. um do you find yourself incorporating different colors in your home for different reasons so so i have i well well in 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 a way in a way yes and in a way no so I, again, wanting the neutrals of the world and a calm <laughs> color palette as a as thinking of the built environment as a backdrop for life, as a stage for life, and that the actors of life, us, the people, are the main show. I've always blended and made a very neutral, I've been drawn to make a very neutral color palette, which is maybe, um, it, it's kind of an interesting answer to a color question about interior design, wanting the absence of color. Yeah, um, but I've always I've always appreciated that, and I've lately been interested in using a color um, a color family, but different different hues or tints of that throughout the entire house. So the whole house then becomes a specific palette of just one color, rather than a blue room and a green room and a <laughs> like a like a red room or something. Um, I I've liked using that as a kind of a story or as a modeling of of, of experiences of spaces that may not be answering your question, but no, no, it's but um, so in, in my, in my recent years, I've been, I've been moving around quite a bit. I don't yet own my own home. However, my parents have renovated their house and I have been in charge of that whole entire <laughs> thing. Um, so that's been, that's been my, my, my laboratory for that kind of thought experiment. So every room in their house is a different shade of a kind of warm neutral not beige not builder's beige but right. a warm neutral with the right correct glossy white paint very traditional i would say kind of american heartland this is for them not for me um <laughs> but i really like the effect of that and and having having um warm uh very warm if there if there's pops of color it's through natural materials like like mm -hmm. the wood furniture the wood floor um a a a um rattan uh, basket or something and having those as the as the pops of energy and color um, and and letting the materials speak for themselves mm -hmm. that said I'm not a fan of natural wood trim I really like painted trim so we all trim is painted white and gloss um, uh, but it's a very colonial home so anyway as far as color goes that's been my approach and I've always even in a professional sense I've always really liked very neutral um, variations, not everything the same, not everything flat. I think it's kind of maybe a little boring people. Modernism 
fell into the the gutter, not the gutter, but in the in the um, fell back on its laurels in in the sense that modernism is white and everything mm -hmm. is white and everything is flat white and maybe there's glossy whites, but it's all white. That's that's well, I love that 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 is a little that's too devoid of color and yeah. life life is color and um. I think a, an interior can be in a continuation of its exterior. Frank Lloyd Wright um, was a master of this, uh, though his interiors were a bit dark. Um, he, he had a thing for like a burnt umber. Anyway, I'm getting <laughs> here. But, but no, as no, as, no, no, keep going. Uh, but as far <laughs> so as- I love the, talking to you. <laughs> I, I, I could, I could, I could, yeah, all day. Um, and, uh, but, but no, I'm, 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 I like light, airy, um, etherealness, um, uh, and, um, I, uh, some very good friends of mine, um, recently redid their kitchen and it's a very, uh, I helped, I helped, I was a consultant, I guess, um, <laughs> with them. And it's, they, they, they kept wanting to achieve light, this, the feeling of what light was, but they didn't want to go white with it. Um, so it's a kind of a, a, uh, a grayish interior that echoes, they have a window in their kitchen and it brings in, it's an interesting thing, a phenomenon that the colors, they have a beautiful garden right outside their kitchen and the colors of the garden, which change throughout the year, they're green in summer and kind of warmer reds in the, in the fall and winter as foliage goes away, but their kitchen inherits the color of the exterior. Oh, so it's an interesting way. Because of, of the window? And because the window, it brings in, and because of their neutral walls, it reflects the color of the garden so essentially their the color of their room changes every day which is a really fascinating um thing that's that it, that's achieved without actually applying a color right um, right and and even throughout the day you know the, the sunlight and under different uh weather conditions uh light from the sun is a uh, ever ever changing uh thing so i that is, that is a very dynamic way to paint a room is with is, yeah. with, light, is with light so mm -hmm. um I think that's something that could be further investigated but um color is very central to to uh humans um to our to, forever we were living outside for eons we were in caves and foraging out in nature and full of color and and um after 1950 everything became very neutral and white and totally artificial and I think we need to get back to our roots and not deny that we are our uh, beings of nature in some way and mm -hmm. our environment mm -hmm. should incorporate color and we respond to colors and we should incorporate that and uh, again I'm, I'm I'm speaking quite a lot on this but it's a passion no 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 that's that's really cool um a couple of things I didn't want to interrupt you I loved your <laughs> thought flow um I do it does make me really think about balancing neutrals with yes. um colors in a space and like when right. when the where the neutrals should be and how much of a percentage they should be right. in a room do right. you have any advice <laughs> for somebody who's maybe working on changing up a room right now how to kind of find that right balance of neutrals for themselves Oh goodness! Well, that's, <laughs> that might be a personal preference to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I could de definitely a personal preference, um, and um, but I think I think a way to approach it would be. I mean, obviously, you could do. Th there, there's different ways to skin that cat, as it were, um, and I think that the classic approach to it would be that you would have a very neutral color palette with pops of color like a like a pillow or an art piece or a um or an accent chair or some or a rug um and that being the way to approach it but another another way that you can kind of achieve i think it's it's almost a higher um more sophisticated approach to it is that you could have a pop of color but make it everything so if you have, if you really like this, this burnt umber red, it's, why not, why not run with it and make the whole room that, including the ceiling and the trim work. And it's all, Ooh. and you can, you can, that, that's, that's great. Like that. Yeah. That's great. And I, it can always not, be repainted. <laughs> it can always be repainted. And it's just paint. It's, it's brave to do that. And it has to be the right color. Um, and it's certainly a statement and it's not the neutral, 
grays and whites tones and blue tones that I personally preference wise like but I do enjoy that that jump into the color world wherever it's it's a it's a statement and um I see it's I've seen it applied in very traditional classical applications and and very modernistic applications and um almost like a so almost a mono chromatic approach to to uh to a space um to to detailing a space so which is almost um, a way of being neutral in and of itself being monochrome and in that way even though it's a it could be a very chromatic color it, it is a neutral because everything um it's it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's interpreted it's, it's felt like experienced like a neutral because everything in the space is, is that color or of that family um and i think that's a very sophisticated if done right um, a very sophisticated application of color and um, take some bravery to do that to paint every every surface of a room the same color or or in that family but um, I I've always responded well to that and really really enjoy that um, I think it applies very well towards uh, in in kind of a renovation application where there's a lot of trim work and architectural details for that color to play off of and you get mm. the shadows from it so if you have a very builder's grade kind of like box suburban mm -hmm. box that may not there may not be enough architectural elements for that color to play off of and it just looks like you put paint on everything um but when it's when it's in a really interesting um say say i was lucky one was lucky enough to have a houseman apartment in paris with all of the plaster work and all of these beautiful windows and, and architectural details and mantles and you painted that space in that way the space becomes kind of a sculpture with the color on it, you notice it for, it's not just the backdrop, it's now the star of the show. And I think that's a really, again, sophisticated um, way to treat color. That's both color and neutral, the sense of neutralness. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, would, I, would, I would encourage people to maybe, if they're, again, if they're brave enough to, uh, to investigate color in that way, uh, moving forward. It works really, really well, I think, in powder rooms. Like a uh, powder room is always mm -hmm. like kind of an expression, mm -hmm. a little moment, a little, it can go above and beyond because it's so small. Um, and so I've seen, I've seen that done successfully. That in, that in, um, and uh, like uh, laundry rooms are, are mm -hmm. can be a really colorful <laughs> space because it's small and utilitarian, but it can be really fashionable. Right. Um, so I've seen it done there, but I, it, it can be in any space I feel. So um, I, I like that. And any any color, green, I've seen it at hunter greens and navy blues and 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 reds even. Um, so um, I've not yet seen that in a kitchen so much, but uh, it, I- Ooh, I that would be very interesting because with that, all the cabinets, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the hardware and, and the elements that, uh, that, that go into a kitchen, I, I could see, I would- be interested in seeing how that works out yes uh, me too so, for sure i'll have to see if i can convince anybody to do this <laughs> do it do it absolutely yeah yeah and let me know <laughs> yeah i will i will um let's see the other thing that you said that i wanted to touch on was the bringing nature indoors mm -hmm. um i well there's a lot to say about it but <laughs> um I've done some research that's shown, well, just, I haven't done the research. I've read about research yeah. <laughs> that has shown that having a lot of natural elements indoors actually encourages people to spend more time together. Oh, interesting. Which is really interesting. And mm -hmm. I think that might go back to what you were saying about how we, as mm -hmm. humans, spent so much time outdoors together without yeah. Netflix. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. And so how it's kind of a, an attraction to bring to bring people together um yeah. Yeah. but do you do you have you have you noticed that at all or is that is that something that is surprising not at all surprising to me I think I think um I think artificial scenarios and when I mean artificial I mean um environments that are devoid of what humans are it, i don't want to say in our dna but what is what what humans and how humans have lived for so long until the past several hundred years to devoid us of that decouples us from ourselves 
and from each other and community. Um, and that's certainly certainly the case with 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 the materials of the space we live in. Um, um, plaster and sheetrock is not is not a natural environment. It's not a it's not a uh, it's not a cave or a a woods scenario or even even wood. It's this is something else. Um, and modernism, which I love, is all concrete and glass. Um, so I I feel that that does. I, I do think that does, that does translate. So I, I know the built, I'll back up for a second here. The built environment does shape how people think and it, and it, and it does, it does uh, encourage or discourage human activity. Hmm. Um, and there's been for ages, the, the theories and applications of, of how the built environment modifies or changes human behavior, both good for, for good and for bad. Things and so I certainly I know I know w without maybe potentially personally seeing it myself I know that throughout history that's been the case and I do know that um, that that maybe perhaps or, or certainly um, the lack of natural um, materials and natural uh, viscera does modify how people behave and the way we think so certainly. Um, I would, I, I, it's, it's not, it's not impossible to conclude without a, a, a scientific study on the matter, which should be the basis of someone's thesis somewhere. Um, I'm sure it is. Yeah. And I, if, if it's not currently right now, how, how, how the built world, and I don't mean urban planning or, or even architectural styles, but just, just the viscera of, of color and material around us, how that modifies human behavior and social interaction. With each other, I would I would argue that natural um, natural materials and warm materials like wood, things that are familiar to our human subconscious, if I could get spiritual about it, almost does does encourage us to be um, uh, does encourage um, certainly a sense of familiarity, but does I would think almost underscore a, a um, civic. Uh, appreciation um, in that this is how people have always lived and this has always been our surroundings um, and there are um, there's different approaches to that so uh, or there's different been different applications diff different applications of that I know in in uh, northern Europe there have been several and I forgive me I don't know the, the names of these these case studies but there have been different um, modernistic like courthouses built in Scandinavia or somewhere Switzerland mm -hmm. that have incorporated consciously wood they wanted a wood environment that was very again, very modernistic but it was warm and it underscored that this is a community and this is not a the government is not a big cold entity above us but it's we're, we're in this together um this contrasts huh. very 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 much with how like the, the Nazis or the Soviets approached their their municipal buildings, which was all about the power of the state over the individual. So monumental scale, cold, polished granite, um, <laughs> and, and served kind of as a sever uh, between people. Um, so I can uh, on a on a on a conceptual historical analysis of things, I I, I very much can, can can believe that. But so I mean, even even having elements of like fire or a fireplace in the home has mm -hmm. always been it's it's a primordial the primordial hearth as we call it or Frank Lloyd Wright referred to it as um, has always been the center of human um, congregation for since the ice age I assume right um, and think of fire as an element that is a very congregating thing that brings people together we don't need that anymore for heating or for eating but somehow the fireplace is always still at least in the united states maybe out of nostalgia a a central element and i so i do i do absolutely believe that that um that color palettes and material selection and even the pro natural proportions of a space um lend themselves towards bringing people together um and if i could go on a little tangent about that just for for a minute here I, yes please uh, okay um, I would argue that buildings that are of a human scale, meaning buildings that are only the height, only achieve the height of a tree canopy, which is our natural 
as humans walking around Europe during the Ice Age or prior to that around Africa, we would only leave the ground to the height of a tree. That's natural to us. Anything more than that starts to become um, uncomfortable. And if mm. you've ever been in a skyscraper, yeah, uh, it, you might you might made become of glass, <laughs> made of glass, floor to ceiling glass. Um, it may you one may become desensitized to it, but that's not a natural human environment. And I would say that buildings of that scale um, do certain things to a city and achieve a higher density that's never achieved in nature or natural human settings, but also divorce us from the natural world because we don't, as, as humans, we don't exist more than 10 feet off the ground. If right. ever, are we doing 1400 feet in the air working and living? Now, I'm not against cities and I, and I think, I think skyscraper uh, high rises are, are, are inspiring buildings and they, they fit with our, our, uh, our, uh, democratic capitalist world certainly so i'm not attacking that at all um but but the most pleasant communities like charleston or savannah georgia yeah <laughs> always always stay within within two or three stories of the ground and it leads towards a very viscerally pleasant built environment both on the exterior and interior buildings because this is what's natural to us this is mm -hmm. not how, this is not forcing us or we're, we're not forced into a scenario that isn't um, the natural human, um, uh, uh, experience, experience of the world. Exactly. Um, and I think that lends itself towards, towards, uh, people being in connection towards one another. Um, that level of density that's achieved with that is a familiar town, um, density. It's not a giant megalopolis, which again, I'm not against ginormous cities at all, but it's, it's a very oh, pleasant, gotcha. <laughs> um, pleasant kind of scenario. So I think, I think if we take cues from nature for design, you can't lose. Yeah. yeah. It's, the, it's really the basis. And I mean, it's been, a, it's, it's, um, uh, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, again, I'll, I'll reference him because he was the master of taking cues from nature. Um, he, he has a famous quote, something to the effect of, um, that he, he said, I believe in God, only I spell it in nature. And Aww. for him, which was, which is, which it's is beautiful, which is beautiful, but, um, and, and without getting really spiritual or, or religious right. about it, I think he was being philosophical. Right. Um, but, um, it's, it's a, uh, it's, that's, I, I think that's a great approach to, to, uh to design both both in art and interior design and architecture and so forth um, to take cues from nature um, that's really the lessons of the universe right there so yeah absolutely so, do you yeah. think that that makes me think about um walls frankly yeah, <laughs> and yeah. do you do you think that makes open concepts mm better I don't know I'm, I'm not sure I mean, where I'm going with this but just thinking yeah. about I mean looking at the flat walls behind both of us thinking that is right. not natural at all however right. I'm personally not the biggest fan of completely open concepts because I enjoy having different spaces but how does that relate to us as right. humans should we all have plaster like curved cave walls <laughs> instead <laughs> well that's that's an interesting question well so so your question touches on a trend in the past i guess 15 20 years of having the open concept house and mm -hmm. hgtv has run with that to it right. to to the <laughs> forever and and everybody on the street knows what open concept means because of them. <laughs> exactly exactly and and the the result of that is is that you have just one living space your living mm -hmm. room family room is the dining room is the kitchen is the hall is the is the foyer is is a lot of things i do not like that personally this is preference right it, it definitely I, is it's preference, preference. Yeah. so don't take I, I i i should have prefaced before we spoke or at the beginning of speaking that these these are my this is my point of view and it's not the law <laughs> right so right. um and everybody's um, gonna want something different in their homes uh, which is important <laughs> which is important and totally valid because yes. everybody has different values and lives differently and that's just okay with that said i don't like the open con total open concept because right. it subtracts from whatever whatever 
Um, and if we're talking, so if we're talking about a uh, single family home, it subtracts the architecture from the home. It's just, mm. you're living in a, in a box, in a room. And so it might be conducive towards having a gathering um, or a social thing where everybody can see each other, but the formality and the poetics of how individual spaces, individual spaces, separate spaces, a dining, living, kitchen, food preparation, um, entrance, greeting, foyer, how those, the poetics of how those separate spaces can interact, but be separate spaces, actually, I think, bolsters connection more than just having an open room. Right. And so I think that's been in a mass produced tract home world, mm -hmm. HDTV world, mm -hmm. that has been that that is lost. And that's not that's not seen. And it's it's a um, it's a value that's hard to appreciate because mostly historic structures achieve this and not everybody can live. That's that's not the majority of the housing um, market uh, right. in the country. So, but I, I, so I personally think that that separate spaces, formal spaces can, can actually bring people, uh, can, can uh, um, encourage connection and actually be a better stage for life than, than just one open space that is just one room. Right. And um, uh, so. Um, I like that, the stage for life view. I, I, I like good way like to put that. it. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I like I, I, I would want or I'm drawn towards architecture and interior design as the it's maybe a little bit more um, involved in our lives than just a backdrop as to our lives. But it, it, it does, it does, this is, it, it should be, it shouldn't be the star of the show, meaning that we shouldn't live our lives around and modified and in response to something, a built environment that is, that's intrusive. It should encourage what's naturally there. This should be the stage mm -hmm. um, for, for us, in, in my opinion. I think good, good, good design achieves that. So I use, I use the metaphor of the stage for life. Um, kind of metaphor. So um, if we if we took a picture of the family in front of the Christmas tree, I don't want the star of the show to be the Christmas tree. I want it to be <laughs> the family, but it's a very necessary, it makes the picture, um, mm -hmm. for example. But um, uh, yeah, no, uh, that's been kind of, kind of my, but as far as the, uh, going back to your original question on the tangent again, um, uh, I, I personally like formal separation of spaces and even even the original modernists, um, uh, like like Frank again, Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Kahn um, in the 20th century, they 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 were all about reinventing the wheel, but um, they still had had individual spaces for di that served different functions, mm -hmm. and they they remixed and thought about a new way, a new approach towards the connections of those, but it was still not living in just a giant shoebox. There was right. still there was still a, a a thoughtful way to make spaces um, bolster bolster life and, and the different functions that happen within a house and the different experiences with within a house, for example. So I think we can't go so far. I, if we go so far, we start to lose actually design and design yeah. is is very strong. Uh, it went done well uh, towards enhancing the human experience on Earth. Um, so, yeah, so, agreed. So I like, I like the open concept, but not totally open. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yep. Um, the other thing you said earlier that I wanted to ask about, you said around, I think you said in the fifties, we mm -hmm. started to go towards an all white palette. Right. Yes. Is that, I don't, what's your, I know that you're into the history yeah, <laughs> behind yeah. everything. How did that yeah. kind of come about? Because I definitely still see that now, but not so much. I think we're a lot more in the gray family now. Agreed. I definitely agree. Um, and I, so I think tr trendy now is gray, but gray is lovely. Mm -hmm. So is white yes. and so is every color. Yes. So I'm not attacking. <laughs> I'm not, I don't have a thing against reds or warms, but um, uh, the 19... Post World War II, um, the world was rebuilding. Europe was decimated, um, and the, we were coming. So there's a historic context to why white proliferated, and it was really the international style, which kind of preceded World War II a little bit, but came to flourish 
after the Second World War. So the international style was a was an approach to building and 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 design and decor that thought to standardize everything and that everything was to be entirely ration rational based hmm. and that the decadence and and um, uh, decorative motifs at all were seen as a sin and that the modern world was this streamlined machine for living that we have these automobiles these cars these airplanes which are great pieces of engineering even grain silos some architects at that time uh, uh, were all again loved loved um, as great pieces of design they thought they could apply that to to architecture and interior design so everything was standardized white rectilinear a block um, the city city skylines transformed into glass boxes everything mm -hmm. was economy of scale and economy of, of um, material um, and that was also a response to um, historically, in my opinion, to the the um, nostalgia the Nazis had for classical Roman Greece, fascism, mm. the mm. architecture of fascism, fascism was to bring back grand classicism of Rome and Greece. And we as democracies, we can't do that. We have to be brutalist. We right. have to be <laughs> concrete boxes. We can't be associated with that. Which ironically, the ar the architecture of Rome and Greece was the architecture of democracy. So in a way, we were divorcing ourselves from the past. But as far as so anyway, but back to color, everything was made to be white, and white was very much a has been thus associated with modernism and and cleanliness and and mm. the future. But it's it's a and intellectually white is the color of all colors yeah light light white light is has everything in it but it's it's become in my opinion um cliche and it's flat yeah. everything you know modernism <laughs> how many white boxes have we seen that's a that's a modern house irregardless of location it could be south america it could be europe it could be new york um or nebraska a a, a white box is modern but it's been it's been done and it's tired. Um, and uh, I think there are more nuanced ways to achieve um, subtlety in design and a modern a modern approach that doesn't divorce us from again the natural world. Where where in in nature is there ever entirely white environment? That's a box. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean yeah. that's nothing um, nothing like Sounds that. Sounds like and torture in nature. It does. No? And I mean <laughs> the fact that most hospitals are white. <laughs> um, are, you know, which are places, which are places we need, but not places we want to be, right. um, or have to be is also, uh, underscores that point in my, in my mind. So I think there are ways to take cues from nature that are more subtle and, and, um, nuanced and thoughtful than to achieve modernism and to bring us together and to make us feel connected to ourselves in the world and just, you know, the international style white. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, the 1950s, post-World War II, is what made that happen, uh, was was kind of the basis for that. And we've just continued it since. Right, uh, right. To a degree, um, uh, what, 70 years later. So, um, yeah. Do you think there needs to be a big world event to, like, really change that? Or mm -hmm. do you think COVID will do that? No, <laughs> I don't know what it would, how it would do that, but... That's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, question. Well, certainly a, a big world event would change how we, ha and has changed how we think of ourselves and think of uh, communities. Um, and that does obviously modify how we build. Um, I think and, houses and, will have quarantine rooms moving forward. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it could, it very well could. I mean, we live, we live in a very, very, many, many people would say overpopulated world. And that means that disease and being in a globalized world where we're flying planes into a plane, uh, there's there's an international travel, mm -hmm. um, unlike uh, we've ever seen before in populations mix, the proliferation of disease, like we saw in COVID, now we see with monkeypox and whatever else will be next will be, I think become more and more. Um, and I, so obviously domestic architecture and interior design will be modified to reflect that in some way. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, I think there might be a move towards, and I'm speaking only for, for homes here in the United States, there might be a move for a um, kind of maybe a more Japanese approach to living where the shoe never, you never walk, take your shoes into the house. There's a little mm -hmm. depressed like foyer that's tiled and the shoes are left there. And there might be a, um, a way to cleanse yourself before coming into the house if if there's another god forbid pandemic that really that's really terrible um there might be a there might be a modification of of cleansing before you come into the home the ancient romans actually that's had interesting that the ancient romans had had that they had um you would enter the domestic house the villa um and there would be a reflecting pool that was more than just a reflecting pool you would actually bathe in it you would wash your hands and your feet to get the grime of the city off before you go into the house it was oh. called an it called an impluvium, um, and it also served to cool the home because the house was built in a courtyard around this pool. Um, and so maybe we might our domestic architecture might start to incorporate something like that. Um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in Falling Water had a little outdoor fountain that was meant to be you wash your hands before you even touch the front door, um, and. Uh, huh. Corbusier, Le Corbusier, who was a modernistic architect who went too far with the white box. He was the champion of the white box. Even, <laughs> he, even he in his in his Villa Savoie um, in France, uh, which was his his um, uh, his his great architectural achievement, even that had a just a wash basin sink at the front door, and you would wash your wow. hands before you come in. So maybe we'll move towards something like that uh, in, uh, as, as there's more disease and, and plague essentially um, mm -hmm. around the world because we're such a connected world now um, physically. Yeah, yeah. So there, there might be something like that, but psychologically, we, I think it might help. Um, it, it might, it might, I imagine, and I'm just hypothesizing here. It might that, that might uh, drive us to want to, to have warm spaces that are comforting and natural and material and not, and not these, the, not, nothing cold because the world is cold. We mm -hmm. want to go home to our san sanctuary, our safe harbor of home. I could see how that might, there might be a shift in, 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 in um, interior design at least uh, that, that helps achieve that. The, the home is the warm, safe cocoon from from the the troubled world outside yeah um, absolutely i think you're I, right i think that might be a, tra a a trajectory we're on here um so we'll see it's we'll the see. only place you're in quote safe right now right? you know yeah exactly exactly, exactly. away from the world <laughs> away, away from the world and, and safe at home so yeah um, exactly and uh and with people spending more time at home potentially with with lockdowns and 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 uh and um uh social isolation because of, of these diseases that might we're spending right. more time at home so it, it counts it really counts that's already affected the housing market right <laughs> and, it's, and it's affected the housing market certainly yes yeah and, and where people choose to live so um it's certainly modifying the way people live that's that's for sure yeah. one more thing that um mm -hmm. I can't believe it's already up in almost an hour. <laughs> I, I could know, talk to you I for forever. But one more thing I definitely wanted to get in here. Um, we might have to do a second episode at some point, but <laughs> um, is your interest in government buildings. Uh -huh. And you've already touched on it a bunch and I find it fascinating. And I know you and I have talked mm -hmm. before about the mm -hmm. buildings around the mall in DC, yes. but as you yes. were talking about them, I kind of see the Roman influence maybe um, mm -hmm. in, in the Smithsonian buildings versus yes. thinking yes. about like the Department of Energy, uh, cement yes. blocks, brutalism. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So is yes. that, or is that just a reflection of when they were built or do you think it's a reflection of their purposes? Well, so this, so, so you opened Pandora's box. This was actually, <laughs> know, this, right? was, this, this, this was is your big, thesis, this right? This is yes. my thesis. I spent, I spent <laughs> years thinking about this. Um, and uh, so I'll be, I'll be brief because we could be here for 10 hours and you really <laughs> regret asking that question then, but we, I, I'll keep it. <laughs> um, cause I can, I can, I can talk a lot about it, but, um, yes. Yeah, so, so it's, it, that's an interesting, that's an interesting take. Um, our interesting question, um, and the the architecture 
as as the as the federal government historically, as the federal government in the 20th century grew and expanded in the first and second world wars, um, expanded the role and purview of government. Um, these buildings in D.C. in Washington D.C. had to take on a form, and where where what form do we take? And um, but uh, this question was was kind of grappled by the planners of DC prior to that, but was really underscored in the 20th century. Um, so, so planners and designers like of uh, the federal triangle um, um, uh, complex in DC and the national monuments of DC, they, they turned towards looking that, that their, their take, even though modernism was beginning to start to happen in the 20th century at this time, they chose to look to history as uh, for architectural um, for for an architectural catalyst, because it was at that time that the, the bicentennial of the country was happening. We were celebrating the survival of, of our democracy through the world wars. So so we were looking to antiquity to inform our our civic buildings and our municipal buildings. And I'll I'll just speak about the federal government in D.C. Um, there was a, a, a turning to history to inform that because those were that was where our, our virtues of, of self determination through through a representative government came from from mm. it was Roman Greece. So that was of course we're going to build Roman Greek temples for our federal agencies and our for our capital buildings around the state capital buildings around the country. It was only natural. Um, this was also happening at this at the time of the um, city beautiful movement, which was which was a whole uh, whole other thing, um, but a, a resurgence in a love for for um, classical, uh, this was a global phenomenon at that time, but a, a resurgence for um, a love and and um, uh, of, of antiquity and uh, classical architecture because it was beautiful and familiar and it helped to humanize the industrial city and so mm. forth. So, so much of architecture, up to the 1940s in Washington DC, for example, really was a just a remix of the Roman temple or the or the Greek temple <laughs> or or some Roman forum in some way. And it's lovely. We love that. It's a really yes. interesting effect. Um, even though they're not Roman temples, it's the it's it's the it's federal triangle. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, uh, visual. Um, but modernism took over brutalism, which was a response to that, um, totally devoid of, of, of any antiquity or, or reference to, to um, decorative motif. That mm -hmm. took over and has ever since been, unfortunately, in my opinion, even though I'm a modernist, um, uh, I'm both a modernist and a classicist when it comes to architecture. But well, it's um, different at home, right? I guess. It's different at home. And that's why most homes even still today are built in a traditional sense because modernism is, is cold and difficult and not, not the warm, <laughs> familiar thing um, that, that we like. But um, moderns, modernism, brutalism took over and it's, it's, it, it was for, for reasons of economy, and and it was an architecture that was very rational. Everything was rectilinear. It was supposed to be transparent. Um, hmm. And and but really has come to be, in my opinion, sores on a city and dystopian. And <laughs> um, the best example of this, I have to say, is the headquarters of the FBI, which was <laughs> built which was built now it's a it's a noble and virtuous um, uh, government entity that is that is needed and they serve the country every day and the, the bureau is amazing however the form <laughs> of their building their headquarters is entirely antithetical towards for their um, uh, for their mission the building yeah, is anti-human anti out of scale it it hurts the cityscape. There's no there's no commerce that happens there. It's a fortress. It really and is. It's, yeah. And it's a fortress. And it's actually built to be a fortress because um, there's domestic terrorism. And so uh, and even in the 60s when it was designed, that was the fourth the purpose. Uh, the hmm. purpose, the driver of that design. Um, and it shows. But that mm -hmm. hurts, that hurts the government which our government is supposed to be about the people and connection between the people and the state. 
it serves to sever. And so I find that classical architecture much more, not only intellectually do we relate to it as this is a government for the people, but it's also, it's also warmer, friendlier, more porous to the city. And it's not mm -hmm. a brutalist wall that's 40 feet high of concrete. Right. Um, so good modern, modern architecture is very hard to achieve, but, um, as far as government architecture goes, there's been an, it's very, it's very interesting to see that dichotomy at play in Washington, DC, where there's very, very, very classical federal buildings and very, very non-classical federal buildings. And I think it's obvious which ones are, are more successful than, uh, which, which is more successful. So, um, if we're a government of and for the people, we have to have, our buildings have to reflect that because it underscores that moving forward, once the building is built, it, it modifies how we, how we think of the government as an entity. Um, and our government is not a big overboard here in, in, in the United States. It's, it's a representative republic. Right. Um, and so it may, so maybe perhaps we don't have to have a Roman temple <laughs> like 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 a uh, traditional classical building but it can be a modern modernist building that relates to the human scale and to materials that are we're familiar with and are warm um and um unfortunately federal agencies in the past 40 50 60 years have dropped the ball on that and yeah. um, we see that uh, from 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 the FBI headquarters building to to housing and urban development, and I can name a list on and on and on. Um, and so it's a uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, field of study that is still being um, uh, still at play in our daily lives as the federal federal entities um, uh, move into new headquarters and, mm -hmm. and evolve and grow in in, in the world. So it um, is interesting yeah. because as we've talked about with colors and other things. Yeah. Yeah. The built environment around you, I mean, not only does it affect <clears throat> your emotions, but it affects your behavior and it is a reflection of you. So if it's, if you're working, say in one of these buildings or mm -hmm. even just walking by it, I mean, not only does it affect your opinion of yes. that entity, but it actually affects your response and your behavior yes. to it. Yes, yes. Um, yes. Absolutely. But at the same time, I was going to challenge you a little bit, play devil's advocate. If yeah, we didn't please. have these brutalism buildings, I mean, would we appreciate the the Roman style ones? Ah, very, <laughs> very interesting. Now, there, there are fabulous, fabulous, wonderful examples of modern architecture, including brutalism in this world. Most mm. of it isn't. Most, 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 ninety-five percent is not. But so I'm not condemning all modernistic architecture. Okay. But, so what's but an example of a good one? The best example of well, so I'll keep it to I'll keep it to Washington D.C. But okay. um, a very good modernist building is the East Wing of the National Gallery, which was designed by um, Ian Pei. Oh. And it looks like a knife, and it's very angular, and the space yeah. inside is a play of light. Um, it's clad in a stone, not concrete, but it reads mm -hmm. like a concrete. Um, right. And it's technically not brutalist, but it is kind of brutalist. Um, that is a fabulous A plus building, in my opinion, that responds to the city, is welcoming and warm, is a great stage for all of the artwork and and um, events that the that the building showcases and hosts. Um, that's architecture, modernistic, brutal, brutalistic architecture done well. Done it's well, not, okay. It's not, That's fair enough. It, and and it's right next to the National Gallery, which is a classical Roman, yes. uh, Greek-like, <laughs> entirely different spectrums of, 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 of modernism versus traditional classicism, but they play well. They're married together. That's a beautiful relationship. And in fact, the contrast between them highlights the virtues of both the architectures together and their their dichotomy their their doesn't it doesn't fight each other it's actually a marriage it's mm. a yin and a yang and it's it's beautiful that's that's really good modernistic architecture um brutalist architecture when it's done well but when it's not done well it's essentially a a a um a bunker in the middle of the city and that's right. That's and there's not, quite a few of them, yeah. Quite a few of them, and that's anti-human, and that serves to cause a distrust 
uh, on the part of the public for our government, but our government's us, and we that's hurting that relationship, which doesn't need to be hurt anymore. And the and it kind of separates the that government agency from from the people, and they're supposed to be taking their cues from the people, and it's not. So it it striates, it, it separates, and that's that's a death blow for self uh, for a government that's supposed to be up and about the people. Right. Um, architecture really plays a part in that, and so the the best quote on that is that uh, is by Winston Churchill, and he probably said it in a drunken stupor, but it's a great quote. <laughs> um, and it's and it's and I'm paraphrasing him here. He 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 stated that we people we shape our buildings, but then they shape us. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important to have, um, uh, he's entirely right. And especially in government buildings in a democracy, mm -hmm. um, our buildings have to, have to incorporate our values and ideals. And the center of that is that our government is not a separate entity from the people that we are the government. Right. We have a determining say in it, and 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 bad modernistic architecture is a to, cuts that relationship. Um, a lot of other things do as well, and partisan of politics course. It, it right. is, and yeah. media and is a whole other thing. But but it's not helped at all by by bad modern architecture. That's a bunker, and it's just it just separates, and that's that's um, we have to resolve that. I feel. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, so. it, it, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, thinking about just all the all the tourists that come through DC and yeah. see that and feel that. I mean, it right. gives, it definitely right. puts a specific perspective on the relationship. Certainly. But Certainly, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think that's such a good place to end, unfortunately. <laughs> it was uh, such interesting conversations. So I really appreciate you taking a chance letting me throw these things at you <laughs> absolutely well i'm i'm honored and privileged um to speak with you today and they're they're wonderful thoughtful questions and um i thoroughly enjoyed this thank so. you so much dan i appreciate it be sure to check out the complete show notes for today's episode at trimspaces.com forward slash spaces speak the notes include a link to the YouTube video of the episode, the full guest's bio, links to connect with them, a summary of key ideas from the episode, and a photo of their favorite piece of furniture or decor. <laughs>